All right, we're gonna need a couple cold ones for this video. Buckle in, folks, because we're jumping right off the deep end. That's supposed to look a bit cooler than it did. Ah. Oh. I'm a proper video essayist now because I drink on the job and I'm kind of kind of wild. I'm unpredictable, you know. I'm I just, I, you can't stop me from analyzing pieces of pop culture. I can't be stopped. It's what I do. Okay, but but listen though. But listen, but listen. In all seriousness, we need to talk about Bolt. <laughs> People tend to forget about Bolt. Out of Disney's entire catalogue of historic and modern masterpieces, Bolt isn't one that often comes up in conversation. Unless, of course, you're conversing with me, in which case you might start to wonder if you too are actually living within a television programme. That'd be pretty crazy, because that's how often I talk about Bolt. I love this movie. It's one of my favourite Disney movies of all time. Not because it's an artistic masterpiece, or because it's a cinematic titan, or any of the usual reasons that Disney films usually stick out in pop culture. I love Bolt because it's pretty simple. It has heart, it has charm, it's funny, and I love a road trip movie, especially one about a dog. Homeward Bound is one of the best films ever made, and don't even try and contest that. When Shadow comes bounding over that hill to Peter, don't tell me your eyes are dry. And if you've never seen it, go watch it right now. I'm pr pretty sure it's on Disney+. The 1993 one, not the 1963 one. Although, I don't know, maybe the 63 one is good as well. Back to Bolt, though. This film imprinted itself on me as an 11-year-old, and I, I used to watch it all the time, even into my teens. It just brings me great comfort. It's the, the nostalgia combined with the heartfelt message of the movie that just ropes me in every time. I even have two plushies of Bolt. Yeah, look, I, that felt like a flex until I saw myself holding them on camera like a fucking mental patient. <laughs> Let me give you a rundown of the movie for those that might be out of the loop or were born after 2010. Bolt is a film about a white Swiss shepherd. Yes, they are real. I want one. I'll probably get one. I mean, I honestly, I've already got one meme dog. I guess the two wouldn't be a harm. And he's the star of a popular action television program about a superhero dog with superpowers, like the ability to flip a car over his head with his head or a bark so loud it registers a nine on the Richter scale, among other things too. Of course, the dog doesn't actually have superpowers, but he believes he does. He believes the show is his real life, which sets him on a journey of self-discovery. His owner, Penny, is kidnapped at the end of an episode of filming, not in real life, just in the show, to keep things fresh for audiences, leaving them on a cliffhanger. To keep Bolt convinced the show is real, she can't comfort him at the end of filming, so he believes she really has been kidnapped by the evil Dr. Calico. At the first chance to escape, he does, and he heads out on the search for Penny. Along the way, meeting quirky characters, picking up sidekicks, and discovering who he really is and what it means to be a dog. It's a lovely movie. It's full of so much emotion, and I think it's severely underrated. However, the other night, I decided to rewatch it. I hadn't seen the thing in a long time, so I thought it would be fun. And it was. It holds up. I love it. But, about 30 ish minutes in, I notice something constantly recurring. One theme and one message which is woven throughout the movie. And no, I don't mean the very obvious jokes about Hollywood being cringe. I mean how much this movie takes the time to use its narrative and characters to mock, criticize, and call out the Disney machine. I could be imagining this. Maybe it's just a coincidence, but dude, the evidence for it is so goddamn overwhelming. Layered beneath this film about loss and love and freedom from the shackles of unrealistic expectations is a deep critique of Disney itself. I honestly have no idea how they got away with this, how they managed to make this movie when the whole thing is calling them out, and it doesn't even feel like a tongue-in-cheek joke that's just a bit of self-aware comedy that Disney could get behind. It comes across as the perfect satire used to seriously criticize the business practices at Disney. Whether it be on the business side, the human side, or the marketing side, and I don't care if the writers come to me and say this wasn't their intention. I, 
I'm making it your intention. It's too good to be a total coincidence. Part one, the Disney Plus show, Bolt. Let me start by drawing your attention to the television program side of Bolt. Before we get into the characters and the themes and how they link back to my point, the TV show is a perfect starting point to wrap your head around what the writers were trying to point towards. The show, simply named Bolt, is a very basic run-of-the-mill show that seems to have been going for a good few years. It's well established, it's very popular as we see by the posters and billboards so big they take up entire skyscrapers and the fact that the network has to intervene because the show has become too predictable, leading to the journey Bolt eventually goes on. This show is maybe the perfect allegory for something Disney still does to this day, just in a slightly different way. Putting out the most generic, the most shallow schlock imaginable to draw as many eyes as possible, and the most money without having to create anything with too much depth. Bolt is a show I could imagine airing on Disney Plus today, something that just grows and grows and perpetuates itself with its mind-numbing fan service and cameos without really having much to say for itself. Behind all the exciting music, the superpowers, the dark and moody Zack Snyder colour grading is a television program that is as basic as they come, and Disney was certainly releasing things of this nature back in 2008 when Bolt released. College Road Trip, Tokyo Mather, Beverly Hills Chihuahua, the very mixed Chronicles of Narnia films, Game Plan or Underdog, a movie about a dog with superpowers. After we witness an episode of Bolt where really nothing at all happens, the truth is revealed to us. The set starts to be taken down and Penny takes Bolt to her trailer which sits alone in the middle of the filming lot. Now, let's not worry about why Bolt doesn't question the fact that the trailer is always so close to the end of the mission, or why he doesn't question why the very important plot he was just experiencing ends right then and there, just in time for him to have a much needed rest. I suppose you could say that given it's all he's ever known, why would he think this isn't normal? People raised in captivity don't have a concept of the outside world, so to Bolt, why would he be aware that this isn't normal practice? Which begs the question of the ethics behind what they're doing to him. This dog believes with his entire being that this world is real, that he has superpowers and that he has to protect Penny. Back in the trailer, you can see him guarding the door. Penny tries to get him to wind down and play, of course, being fully aware that she's an actress, but Bolt resists. You can see he wants to play, but he refuses, opting instead to keep staring at the door to the trailer in case evil comes knocking to abduct his person. This isn't the life that a dog should have. He's been trapped, confined, and without his knowledge. It's really sad. But this is where things get nuanced, because it's not the network that is keeping Bolt in the dark about the truth of the television program. It's actually the director. The next scene, we see the creators and showrunners looking back at their footage of the most recent episode, and they notice that they let a boom mic in the shot. Now, of course, how long is the boom mic's arm is a great question. I'm going to choose to gloss over this for the sake of my sanity because we, we see the scene and where were the crew even standing? Where was the boom mic being held? No, I'm sorry, I can't do that. We have to move on. I cannot do this. Mindy from the network, which sounds a lot like Mickey, chimes in to ask why it matters if the dog sees a boom mic. Uh, who cares if the dog sees a boom mic? The director or showrunner or whoever he's supposed to be here explains exactly why, but it's less about his reasoning and more about the way that he's saying it. Mindy is completely apathetic to what are in her mind excuses. It's very clear, however, to us that the showrunner is deeply passionate about this show, making sure it's as convincing as possible for the audience because it elevates his creation to a higher plane of art. It resonates then with the people on a level you cannot reach with regular acting or stunt dogs. If the dog believes it, the audience believes it. Mindy doesn't care though, she brushes it off. She cares about ratings first, the art form second, and this illustrates a disparity between the network and the creator, between Disney, the corporation, and the people who make these movies, the creatives. 
I'm sure at Disney, interference from the higher-ups is commonplace, happening on almost every big-budget movie, the ones that flop and the ones that skyrocket to success. But regardless of that, it feels like the writers of Bolt, the movie, are irritated by the way Disney intrudes on the creative process. Their want is money over a meaningful story, and it ends up muddying so many artists' work, something I'm sure the writers of Bolt, Dan Fogelman and Chris Williams, know all too well with their extensive work as Disney writers. Despite having plenty of successes, and I'm sure making tons of fucking money, if you're in a creative position, you're going to feel that breath down your neck from the guys in the suits at one point or another. And regardless of how successful your work ends up being, that will bother you. And I feel like that's exactly what is being pointed out here. But not just that simple and basic disparity. There's a nuance, because it's not simply good versus evil, it's more than that. The showrunner is effectively abusing Bolt emotionally by forcing him to be alone, isolated and live out his life as a performing monkey for the benefit of his art. Despite having the best intentions for the creative process, he still doesn't necessarily have the best intentions for the people serving his art creation. And so, we're left with what is an incredibly nuanced dissection of the relationship between a corporation like Disney, the creatives under them, and the actors even further beneath them. And all of that is done in this one scene with heaps of delicious subtext that I have gobbled up until I couldn't gobble it anymore. The next scene we get is another episode of Bolt, however this time it's done through the lens of knowing the show is just a show, which allows for the movie to bring light to the many, many hard-working people on a large-scale production like this. It's clear the writers of this film have respect for the camera people, the lighting department, hair and makeup, sound effects, visual effects, editing, audio engineering, set design, and so much more. This sequence highlights all of that. The people who bring these shows to life care deeply, they work hard and so much goes into producing big budget films and television and I love that about this scene. The movie really does highlight all the smaller people you wouldn't normally think of that work to create the TV show of Bolt and it does so in a way that makes you appreciate their part in that, their role that they play in creating things. And so, whilst critiquing Disney, the movie also manages to give props to all of the lesser-known individuals on set, which I think is a very kind sentiment to weave into your movie about how bad Hollywood can be. At the end of this episode, the showrunner caves to the network, and the episode is left on a cliffhanger. Penny is kidnapped and isn't allowed to see Bolt because it would dispel the illusion. A now anxious and frantic Bolt escapes from the trailer and finds himself flustered out in the real world, which is where the true story of this film begins. But before we move on to that, consider for a moment that the entire core drama of the film, the loss of Bolt and the despair of Penny, is caused while, yes, by a domino effect of lying to the dog, the final push is that the creative caves to the network, to the higher-ups illustrating that downfall comes from kneeling to people who have no understanding of the creative process, seeking only to challenge and alter your vision. It doesn't make what the showrunner did right in the context of the film's events, but I think what it's trying to illustrate and the metaphor that it's trying to create is that everything can go well and your vision takes a lot of work, a lot of sacrifice, but sometimes if you end up caving to the network, the entire thing comes crumbling down. Maybe not in ratings, in your own integrity. Part two, Penny's absolute and complete fucking anguish. This sets up two halves of the film, which, <coughs> sorry, I shouldn't have started talking before I finished, before I swallowed. This sets up two halves of one film, which is a nice way of framing a film of this nature, especially for the message it's trying to convey. We have Bolt out on his journey, which we'll talk about later. And then we have Penny, a sad, lonely, isolated, 14 year old girl, 13, 12, oh, I can't tell kids ages, but she's young and unequipped to deal with life without her best friend, especially since Hollywood, Disney, has robbed her childhood from her and forced her into a life of servitude under the mouse king, overlord, dictator, bastard, sorry, sorry, I got personal. The Penny side of the story is used sparingly across the movie. Of course, the entire thing was marketed to us as Bolt, the dog, and his escapades with other animal friends, but just because Penny is used sparingly doesn't mean Penny is unimportant. Penny is crucial, in fact. Penny is key. 
The first time we cut back to Penny is a whole 37 minutes into the film. The framing shows the lone trailer with the name Bolt on the front, not her trailer, Bolt's trailer. In fact, we never see a trailer for Penny, only ever for Bolt, which I think, if you'll indulge me, implies that this is her trailer in fact, and the powers that be don't deem her character important enough, and thus her important enough, to give her a big sticker inside of a star like Bolt has. We see the water tower off to the side, obscured by some buildings. A water tower is an iconic piece of Hollywood iconography, with some Bolt promotion slapped on the side, something Disney is absolutely no stranger to. However, this is conveying clearly the disconnect between Hollywood and reality. The world people see is on the water tower, a triumphant Penny and Bolt. However, in reality, Penny is inside of this isolated trailer, crying, lonely, because her dog is gone. This is where we'll talk about her agent. Because we need to talk about her fucking agent. This guy, oh, this fucking guy, played by Greg German, is fucking aggravating. He's a sociopath. He's an embodiment of everything invisibly evil about the Hollywood machine. He's incredible. The writing of this character, the performance, just gets me every time. No matter how many times I watch this film, he still makes my fucking skin crawl. It's perfected to a T, to make you hate him, and in turn, feel for our main characters, cheer them on, because god damn it, he's such a slimy little fucking weasel. He comes in, happy as ever to deliver some good news. However, not even considering the loss of Bolt, good news to this fucker is appearing as a guest on The Tonight Show, and even in a world where Bolt was still around, I can't imagine being told you're meeting Jimmy Fallon is ever good news. <laughs> he shows a complete lack of empathy, a complete lack of care, but that's the attitude you need to make it as a star of Disney, as a successful Hollywood actor. You need someone who lacks any semblance of humanity. It might appear as a stretch, maybe that's an exaggeration. And sure, it definitely is, but that's what the movie is saying. It's using the exaggerated persona of this agent to extenuate the mindset needed to thrive in this business. Penny sits with her mother, the background filled with images and good times with Bolt, as She's comforted by her mother, and the agent stands alone, the background barren, other than a few bags of dog food. Now I do have to ask, how did Penny end up in this life? Like, did she choose acting? Because she never really seems to love it all that much. She wants a normal life, so did her mother push it on her? Maybe it was her father, maybe he sucked and was abusive and forced his daughter into this life, and now her mother and her are kind of stuck here. Maybe he's not around anymore because he blew all of his daughter's money on drugs and alcohol and fucking died or something. None of this is even implied in the movie, I'm just kind of spitballing here. The camera focuses on Bolt, as the mother says, he can't have gone far. Then we transition to a sign of Ohio. Sorry, I know this is apparently a meme that all the kids had on TikTok a little while back. I've never seen one of these memes, but I've, I've been told it's a thing on stream. And I have no idea what the meme could even entail, so now I just find Ohio really funny from a total lack of context and understanding. <laughs> Let's roll it back though, because this scene we've looked at is not the first time we see any of this. It's not the establishing scene. That happens 23 minutes earlier in the film. After the first episode concludes, after the trailer scene with Bolt, Penny leaves and is greeted by the agent for the first time. Penny remains somber because she just wants a real life for Bolt. The agent tries to ignore her mood in favour of pulling her away to a photo shoot. Penny asks her mother if she can take Bolt home this weekend. Her mother is apprehensive but clearly wants to say yes. The agent, however, has a hold over their life. He ultimately chooses what happens, but it feels like this power dynamic comes from a place of deep emotional abuse and manipulation. He says, as your friend, yes. As your agent, no. In a way where Penny can't confront it, she can't dispute it, it's said in such a way that she's left feeling like she's being irresponsible and selfish to take Bolt home. Because as a friend, he would love to say yes, of course he would, he's a friend, he wants to, he wants to say yes, take Bolt home. 
But as, as her agent, who cares about her career, about her financial stability, he has to say no. He's forced to. It's not because he wants to say no. He has to, because he's an adult, and that's his responsibility. Penny, as a kid, looking up to that, thinks, well, I want to I be mature too. I've got to be responsible as well. I can't be happy. And even though, as the audience... We're aware that that's not true. Taking Bolt home wouldn't be an issue. This setup they have going is the true irresponsible and selfish thing. Penny and her mother are being completely fucking gaslit by this agent and the company into thinking this is normal. And taking your dog home is morally reprehensible. This is exaggerated and it's slightly silly in the context of a kid's film. But at the same time, it's a completely honest example of emotional manipulation. A very serious and rampant type of abuse that people face on a daily basis all over the world, and it's done in a way that's honestly a little bit chilling the older that you get. As a kid, this agent is a funny, villainous caricature. You hate him, but it's fun to hate him. As an adult, he stands for a very real evil that exists in the world. And not just that, but he clearly is a representation of who the writers believe make the Hollywood world go round. Why is Penny so upset all the time? Why does she feel trapped? Why can't she escape? Well, it's because of the ruthless agent that the company, Disney, has assigned to her. To make them as much money as possible, but at the expense of Penny's life. And consider for a moment how poignant it is that they decided to cast Miley Cyrus in this role. Someone who was in this exact same position as a teenager. She was going through this. Disney owned her. That seems purposeful. One of the most heartbreaking scenes in this film though, and the last one of Penny alone before Bolt comes back, spoiler alert, the dog doesn't die alone in a ditch as would happen in reality, he does actually come back. Penny is printing off flyers, which is really funny to me, like, you're, you're a famous superstar, put out a damn tweet, get your people to contact every dog rescue place or whatever in the country, like, you have better means to find this dog than printing out flyers like some elementary school kid. Anyway, the agent strolls on in with more good news. Look who we found, young lady. It's Bolt. They found him. Bolt! Yeah, that's <coughs> right, that little puppy dog. That is not Bolt. Well, that depends on how you look at it. This motherfucker. Like, honestly, this motherfucker. I can't tell you how this scene pisses me off every time. Even just making this video, I'm so angry at this dude, he needs to be taken into the street and shot in the back of the head. And you can do that in America, legally, or, or so I've been told. Penny, of course, knows it's not Bolt, because, well, obviously you're going to know if it is or isn't your dog. But this guy still tries to gaslight her. It's not him. I think it's him. I do. He also tells this story about a baseball glove that I think explains a lot about why he is the way he is. And actually adds nuance to his character that didn't even need to exist. You know, when I was little, I wanted a bicycle, but my parents got me a baseball glove. So you know what I did? I pretended that baseball glove was a bicycle and I rode it to school every day. True story. He was abused. That's abuse. And he tells that story like it's funny. And so it gives a depth to the agent that didn't even need to exist for his role in the story, but it gives it to him anyway. And it says that even this guy's a real person. His parents weren't great to him. He went through a lot. And that's why he turned out the way that he did. It doesn't make it okay, but it helps you understand a little bit. And this also shows very astutely, these stars are completely expendable to these people. Not to the creatives and the writers and the directors, but to Mindy and to the agent who, by the way, doesn't even have a name, which I kind of think is fucking incredible. It doesn't matter if Bolt is really Bolt. He can be replaced. And of course, so can Penny. If she isn't willing to forget her lost dog, do the fucking acting thing. But the kicker in this scene for me, the one that plays into the entire point of this video, is when Mindy from the fucking network shows up herself to play good cop and get Penny to move on. If we don't get back into production, people are going to lose their jobs. Good people, with families. But Bolt's still out there, and we feel for you. And the last thing we want to do is ask a little girl to make a grown-up decision. But it's come to that. We need you to move on. We need you to let Bolt go.
The way she's acting all nice, using a little girl's desire to be seen as mature and adult to get what she wants, it's sickening. Penny and her emotions are a plaything for all of these people, these money-grubbing execs, agents and studio heads who need the show to continue because they need to get fucking paid. Putting the jobs of the stagehands on this little girl as if it's her responsibility in any way at all, it's awful. It's, it's terrible. And it again plays into the idea that these people, this industry, this company, Disney, is the worst. That it's full of evil people out for themselves and willing to step on anyone to get what they want. But the best part is how it's not explicit, at least not entirely. The writers use exaggeration to play with the message they're trying to convey, but at the same time employ subtlety to convey it. These scenes with Penny alone are sparing. There are only two of them in the entire film during the period where Bolt is missing, but both work hard and fast to lay the idea that the film wants you to be thinking about. The world Penny is in is a prison. It's bad, it's controlling, and it harms young actors. In a way, Penny really has been abducted. She really is in a prison, and she really does need Bolt to save her. Part 3, Bolt needs to get the fuck out of Ohio. Bolt is the hero of our story, but it's a subversion of the heroic Bolt we see in the television show. Disney's idea of a hero is not reality's hero, and it's a lesson that Bolt has to learn over the course of the film, and he meets several characters that allow him to do that. The first character he meets is Mittens, a cat who lives on the streets because they were thrown out by their owner years ago, and that's made her jaded, cynical, and also street smart. This is this is doubly funny because cats are cats are already street smart. Mittens acts as a foil to Bolt across the story. She's the reality to his fiction, and they butt heads continuously as she tries to get him to see what he thinks is real isn't real. But it goes deeper than that because it's not just the show that Mittens believes isn't real, it's the relationship that Bolt has with Penny that she believes isn't real. The part we know as the audience is real. Bolt is slowly being taught it's not, and when Mittens ends up being correct again and again and again, it's not hard to understand why Bolt could conceivably believe that Mittens was right about Penny too. However, this has absolutely nothing to do with the actual premise of this video, but what it does show is that your view of reality can be obscured the opposite way as well. Bolt believes his TV show is real, it is not. Mittens is wise to this, but ignorant to the fact that Penny really does love Bolt. Bolt needs this as a part of the narrative because otherwise he has no true doubt to fight against and triumph over by the end, but Mittens also acts as a sus- <laughs> Sorry, fuck, that got me way too good, what a fucking- I'm an idiot. But Mittens also acts- as a surrogate for us as the population of Earth consuming the lives of celebrities through our TVs and deciding on a whim what's real and what's not real. Being told by a third party that Penny doesn't care about him. Purely because Mittens is jaded herself, she doesn't believe anything someone like Bolt has could possibly be real. I'm sure that you've probably had conversations, maybe with parents or grandparents, and the way that they view celebrities, they'll tell you, this person is this, definitively, this is what they are. And you'll think to yourself, well, that's not true. There is a nuance to celebrities, there's a nuance to these people, it's not, it's not as black and white as that. But some people, through their TVs and through their talk shows, their news media, will form an opinion of someone they don't even know. And that's another harm of the media, and with Disney itself as well, because Disney likes to make people out of their actors, not just characters. They'll have them on little ads between their shows, they'll make sure they talk to their audience. They want their audiences to connect with these actors on a parasocial level because it helps their ratings. And Mittens has fallen into that in a negative way. And this parasocial relationship, it doesn't just help positively for ratings, it can negatively impact the actors themselves. When people believe they know about these people, that they understand them on a fundamental level that they never, ever could through a screen, it harms these people. When they end up in the news for controversies, when people decide to turn against them, when public opinion isn't favourable anymore, it's emotionally damaging. And a lot of that is built up by the Disney machine, and Mittens personifies that for us. Catifies that for us. That's not a real phrase. 
The most important character though to Bolt's arc and to the idea I'm talking about with this video is Rhino the Hamster. He's a funny character, he makes me laugh a lot with his antics, but it's his heart that is core to this video's concept. Rhino is the true fanbase of Bolt, like the television program I mean. You can take that how you will, given he's depicted as stupid, fat, lazy, and brain dead, which might have something to say about the true fans of things like Star Wars or Marvel, but I didn't say that, that's the movie Bolt, the movie Bolt said that, so take it up with them instead of me. The thing here though, is that Rhino represents someone who deeply understands the show Bolt, who understands the intent of the filmmakers, who understands the characters and themes and takes it on in his own life. It's actually a beautiful mirroring with what we see towards the start of the film. There's these pigeons, and they're supposed to represent the audience that the network is seeking. They want to produce something so widespread and all-encompassing that it brings in all kinds of audiences to increase ratings, not because they respect the integrity of the show or appreciate the art, and so you see these pigeons who recognize Bolt from somewhere, but they can't quite remember where. You see a bus pass by in the background with Bolt's face on, and at the end of the sequence they're sitting on a billboard, a giant billboard, which shows how much of a huge deal this show is and how much they're marketing it. But by being for everyone, you end up being for nobody. And so these pigeons, who swear they recognize Bolt, can't even remember his name because the show didn't resonate with them. Despite the fact that the network got the ratings they wanted, they got them to tune in, they watched Bolt. By broadening the show's general appeal, they don't have the loyalty because the show lost its integrity. And that's what the writers of the Bolt movie are saying here. In trying to appeal to everyone, you appeal to nobody and you lose your identity, integrity and all sense of emotional investment. When you look at Rhino though, someone who's been a fan of Bolt for years, he recognizes Bolt instantly because he connected with the show. It spoke to him, it meant something and he has a deep emotional connection to the characters and themes. It's honestly really clever when you think about it, and it comes to a head by the end of the second third of the film, where Bolt is slowly feeling more broken by the fact that he isn't who he thought he was. He's not a superhero, he's just a regular dog. But Rhino, having connected with the show, gives Bolt a speech, and everything he says is about the emotional resonance of the show, not of the physical attributes of the protagonist. Rhino gets Bolt, and in that moment, Bolt gets Bolt too. The reason it was so popular, the reason it resonated with Rhino wasn't because of the superpowers or the fight sequences, it was because it taught Rhino that he fucking matters. He can achieve great things if only he puts his mind to it, and in that moment, it does the same for Bolt. The original merits of the show that Bolt helped to craft helps to show Bolt how to save mittens. And to be a hero for Rhino, who never stops seeing him as this hero, despite the makeup fading and the mentality of a superhero waning, Rhino believes in him because it's about so much more than cool CGI fights. It's about the heart and the soul of the thing that latched onto Rhino and made him feel something. The true audience of the show gets it. But the network chases ratings and so creates something that loses emotional resonance, but the lessons learned from the connection to the show's themes allows Bolt to save Mittens, gives Rhino purpose, and restores his life despite everything being turned upside down. I think this speaks to the idea that art is important. It's so much more than numbers like networks make it out to be, like Disney probably makes it out to be. To so many people in so many places, these pieces of art mean something, and they're being twisted by corporations like Disney to serve nothing but their bottom line. And this then plays into the central concept of Penny's arc. By using the idea of a show's emotional resonance to detach Bolt from the mindset he'd been forced into, he begins to heal because the themes of a piece of art can be applied to life in a way that gives people meaning. As Bolt becomes happier, as he becomes more in touch with reality and further away from the mentality of Hollywood, as he finds greater purpose, the bolt makeup that was so bold and so strong to begin with fades away. It washes off. Bolt is cleansed of the scars caused by Hollywood, of the mark it left on his life and his mental state. This all finally culminates in the climax of the film, in which an accident causes the studio set to begin burning. Penny, who is left hanging above the fire in a harness for a part of the show yet to be filmed, is in great danger because the studio execs are horrible people and wanted to save their skin first. 
The lack of care is made so incredibly clear here. The sprinklers don't work, I guess. And so Penny is left suspended in the air, potentially moments from death. Nobody is willing to enter the building except for one dog, one hero, who believes he has a shot at saving his person. The last real thing left, and as the establishment burns to the ground, only then do Bolt and Penny reunite. Because ultimately, it was never distance keeping them apart. It was Hollywood. It was Disney. It was these obstacles put in place for nothing more than making money at the expense of people, and Bolt does what a hero does. No special effects, no CGI, no script or set. He saves Penny in a moment of complete and total authentic love. And from this, Penny's mother finally takes a stand. It took the burning down of the machine itself for her to see the forest for the trees and put her family back together. And like I said, it was never the distance that was the problem. The distance only allowed for the barriers to become more tangible to understand. Penny was always as distant from Bolt as she was during the events of the film, and the same for her mother. In the fire and in the removal of the agent, finally we see Penny, her mother, and Bolt together. Happy because Disney is nowhere in sight. In one of the most classic storytelling techniques dating back to its use in the Bible, fire is used to purify as a catalyst for enlightenment, and in the heart of the fire, where it's brightest, that's where Penny and Bolt are reborn. Maybe I went a little bit too hard on that last bit, maybe that's not intentional, but... You know, you've come this far, just humour me. Part 4! Hollywood kind of sucks a bit! Things don't end here though, because the film closes on our characters' happiness. They've found purpose and family and everything is well and good, but the Hollywood machine, Disney, simply pushes on. And it's always aimed at the lowest common denominator. Upon arriving in Hollywood to find Bolt when he goes after Penny towards the end of the film, we get this line from Rhino. There it is! The most terrifying place on earth! The thing that does it for me though, is what they do with the final set of pigeons. When Bolt arrives in Hollywood, he's approached by two pigeons, who pitch him an idea for an episode of Bolt, or for a new show maybe. No way, wow, Bolt, I'm a really big fan of yours brother. I know, I, I know you're a busy dog, but if you've got a second, we'd love to pitch you an idea for your show. Tom's better at pitching, Tommy's got the spotlight. <clears throat> Wait for it, aliens, oh snap. Aliens? You can tell by how they're framed, you're meant to be laughing at them, they're idiots and their ideas suck, and you can tell Bolt is dumbstruck by them, inevitably using them to get back to the studio, but the best part about this is that once Penny and Bolt have left and are living on a nice farmhouse in the country, they tune into an episode of Bolt. And what happens in this new episode? But fucking aliens! This is probably the clearest piece from the entire movie that outlines what I've been saying. Disney seems to let the dumbest and greenest writers on their products because they are desperately trying to appeal to the lowest common denominator. Big action sequences, making things bigger and bolder with little semblance of heart or soul or what made the thing good to begin with. The pigeons are trying their best to grift, like so many writers out there these days. They simply don't care about the craft and the art form that is storytelling, that is filmmaking, and in the decade or so since this film came out, it's only gotten worse. The pendulum may be swinging back in the favour of cinema in Hollywood as of recently, but it's taken one hell of a long time to do so. And I think it'll always be clear that modern Disney and Hollywood simply don't value the same artistry that maybe they used to, or should. That is totally unrealistic. Absolutely ridiculous. You could say that again. And their reaction speaks to the value they all learned across the film. The show that once captured Rhino and made him feel worth something, now focuses on being a crazy big action show with aliens and explosions and the dumbest shit imaginable because it appeals to the largest group of people, but has lost the one thing that they found among themselves. The important things. Bolt is a critique of Disney, of Hollywood, for the reasons of watering down the art form, of discarding integrity, and of the way it treats young artists like it did Miley Cyrus. But it's as much a movie about finding yourself, about finding others, about a second chance, trust, and genuine love. It's 
about all of that, about these incredibly poignant messages and meaningful themes. It's about more than just critiquing something bad, it's about how you can find something positive within all of that, while also holding a giant middle finger to the Hollywood machine and the mouse overlord. That's, that's me joining them, I'm, I'm joining in. Iceberg! Thank you so much for joining me for this video, I really appreciate you watching. Um, hopefully this resonated with you, maybe made you view Bolt in a different way. Um, it's a movie I've always loved, um, and I've always it's always resonated with me, I've always really liked it. It's always a film that's made me tear up as well. Um, but it wasn't until this recent rewatch that I was like, oh my god, I get it. Like, I get it. I get the film. And maybe I don't. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the writers will say, oh, look, I love this interpretation, but we didn't mean this. And that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. But there's no way, man. It's too much of a coincidence. <laughs> right? Like, I'm not going mad. It's too... It's too close. Of, it's, it makes too much sense. <laughs> this was a video that I made just sort of in spur of the moment. I just decided it was something I wanted to create. Um, if you want more of this, um, more stuff, you know, like this, that's a bit less generic, a bit less, you know, run of the mill, then feel free to support me on Patreon, because the more support I get on Patreon, the more I feel like I'm able to branch out, create, create, be a bit more creative with things. I'm always going to be creative, I'm always going to try to make the best stuff that I can for people that want to watch it, but stuff like this, I'm not expecting it to do well in the algorithm, I'm not expecting YouTube to push this or my audience to really care that much. Um, which is totally fine. Um, nobody owes me anything, but I'm not expecting that, and that's absolutely fine. But to those that did enjoy this and thought this was worthwhile and want me to make more things like this, the best thing you can do is hop over to Patreon and support me. You get stuff back, so it's not just throwing money at me. You get things. I do exclusive stuff, early access, um, additional content, things like that. There's plenty going on over there, and if you want, you can just chuck me a dollar. Or not, you don't have to throw me anything. You don't throw me anything. Drop a like, though. I'd appreciate a like. That's free. Click the like button. YouTube loves it when you click the like button, and so do I. Thank you to everybody that's supporting me, though, on Patreon. I really do appreciate you um, at the $3.50 plus, $3 plus tier. Uh, thank you so much for continuing to support me. I really, 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 really appreciate you. I cannot explain. Thank you so much, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much to everybody that's pledging at the uh, $25 or $15 plus, the producer tier plus. Producer and Master Assassins, thank you. Uh, future James, take it away. Thank you so much, past James, and thank you to all of my Patreon producers. Cabbage, Arenathon, Ethan, I said that in the wrong order, Conocido Sam, Damien the Not-So-Orange Gnome, Flash Paradox, Luke Pierce, and TJ. Take it back, worse, James. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I've got some other stuff to come soon. Um, smaller stuff like this. I, I mean, I don't know how small this is going to be. The recording is over an hour, so I, I was expecting this to be like a 20-minute video, but now I'm a bit scared. But I, I do have some other stuff planned. I want to make a video on Arkham Origins. That's I think that's my next thing I'm going to do before my next big project. Because I love Arkham Origins. I think it's incredibly underappreciated. I think the game has an understated genius to, to how it's written. That's a really good title. That's the title for the video, actually. Let me write that down. And so that's maybe my next project. But I, uh, I made this video in May. So that Arkham Origins video obviously didn't happen. Still want to make it, though. Um... I just don't know when that'll be. So, still kind of relevant information, just that it won't be soon. Maybe it will, I don't know, who knows? This is this is one of those videos where I'm pretty certain that it's gonna flop. Thank you all so much though, I love you to pieces. Um, I love being able to do what I do, and um, yeah, no, it means the world to me that I have any support at all. Uh, thank you so much, and I'll see you in the next one, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>